digit one to set the flip-flop, digit two to unset it. So that's exactly two microseconds apart, peak to peak. In fact, when you look at it, it's fractionally less than that. Today's volunteer meeting is a somewhat different format to previous ones. However, last week, that notch that you saw earlier uh, became significantly worse. We're taking a particular topic with three or four people who are deeply involved and they're discussing the issues, trying to resolve the problems. Don't let the machine con continue executing instructions until the end of the print cycle. Mm. Hold the machine up. We're now in the summer of 2015. My hope is that we will have enough of a machine by the end of this year that we can demonstrate some form of computing. So this is one of our periodic workshops um, and it's Peter Lington talking about the, some of the problems he's encountered with the delay lines, uh, that the signals are getting too attenuated and how can we deal with this? Again, about 35 volts coming out of the preamp and it drops, um, in the first stage of buffering, it drops a lot. Well, I've just had to move out of the room because we're making too much noise in the workshop. Most of the problems this, mo this morning really are to do with, um, with drift and with the size of pulses, which you get very high attenuation on these old circuits. Now, of course, we're all um, transistor engineers here, so we, we've not really encountered these problems. I'm sure when the pioneers are building the machine, they have these meetings on a weekly, if not a daily basis. Because remember, they didn't know what the completed EDSAT would look like or whether it would work. Um, and because they were designing the machine, they in some sense have more options. And that makes it a harder problem um, because you need to decide what to change and you want to make the smallest change um, that solves the issue. For us, it's a slightly different challenge. We are constrained by our goal of authenticity. So we want to end up with something that matches the photographs. Um, given we're so far into the construction, we really don't want to make a change that requires us to rewire everything. That would be inconvenient. Um, and so we're solving a slightly different problem. We also have the advantage of we can use modern test gear to understand what's going on in the circuits. And indeed, we can use modern computers to simulate the circuits right down to the electronic level. You might hear some of our colleagues talking about SPICE, which is a circuit simulation tool. So we can use modern computers to understand what's going on in a way where Wilkes and the pioneers just had to use their expertise and general knowledge of engineering or build it and suck it and see in the traditional way. Some months ago we, we acquired some old diagrams that um, had been done on EDSAT at the end of its life so they weren't really contemporary but we could see some of the circuitry was different to how we anticipated so they'd obviously learned and modified things as they went on. So no, certainly, we know EDSAT, it was the first machine, it, it was designed as they went along, it was a basic design, and then things, some things worked, some things didn't. Currently, as um, I think you probably learn later, we're having a bit of a problem um, with the clock generator, uh, digit pulse generator. These are essential components of the machine because those signals go to every corner of the machine. And if there's an error there or an instability there, it has an impact on everything. In order to use the clock pulses, <coughs> the digit pulses in particular, I uh, put the scope on and observed the digit pulses very time and quality, which was almost unusable. Um, so I trace this back, and it's all to do with nitty gritty detail of uh, exactly which edges of the, of the uh, internal clocks are used to generate the digit pulses. Our first workshop this morning was looking at the clock pulse generator, which in fact was the first circuit we got working. It turns out that the clock pulses aren't as stable as we would like them to be. They, they drift over time and don't really settle down to the machine's been running for 20 minutes, which is going to be inconvenient. So we had a long discussion about the circuit design. We'd copied an original document from the pioneers, um, but we're now convinced there's an error in that drawing, and we've got an idea about how to improve the circuit and make it work better. We're going to try that, and hopefully that will give us a much more stable clock. Interestingly, the circuits are fairly similar to those used by the pioneers at Manchester, who had their baby machine running as a laboratory prototype a few months earlier and the correction makes our circuit much more like the Manchester circuit. That's not a surprise because Wilkes and the Manchester pioneers all work together on radar systems and that's where they got the idea for the circuit from in the first place. Yeah, lots of the electronics here was, was obviously derived from uh, 
people's experience of uh, working on radar during the war. So they were not entirely unfamiliar with the idea of pulse electronics. Um, but perhaps the biggest difference here was that the, uh, it had to be bit perfect, that you couldn't afford to drop a single digit of information or it would make calculations wrong. Um, that wasn't the case with radar. Uh, it was a much more tolerant system. So that's where we are on the MCU then. Very good. Brilliant. Yep. All built, partially tested. And so far it's been very productive. We've looked at the uh, circuits for regeneration for the store. We've still got some problems there. Um, the, the current view is it may be a component problem. We need to do a little bit more measurement to understand whether the valves are working today as they did originally. And if not, we may have to substitute a different component or use a modern circuit and hide it in a tin can so it looks like the original. Of course, I mean, there are always little problems that come along. Um, some are man-made, some are due to uh, lack of understanding. But in, th in this case, uh, this hole here should have had um, an, a half adder in it uh, for the program counter, for example. Unfortunately, um, I made an error a few months ago and used a component from the current age which was only rated for 50 volts. I didn't think about it at the time. This computer runs at 250 volts. So this, um, this component here is a 100 picofarad capacitor. Unfortunately, it's only designed to operate at the maximum of 50 volts. Uh, it was put in this circuit here. This valve here is the output valve from, from an amplifier, and this is the capacitor. But when it went, it destroyed the following valve uh, it's replaced now by um, the appropriate 500 volt capacitor. Well, one, uh, actually, one observation which I would like to make was that inadvertently, while soldering some modifications in place in the racks, my finger touched the HT and tested the, um, <laughs> the leakage, circuit. Uh, leakage circuit, which actually failed. No, you mean it, it worked? It was a failed test. No, it didn't work. Oh, yeah. And I got a significant nip up this <laughs> finger through the elbow and he didn't trip it no. no so we're taking a break for lunch in quite an important meeting we've now constructed several of the various subsystems that make up edsac and we're starting to run into issues as we connect these together we're finding some of the signals aren't powerful enough to drive the, the circuits they're supposed to we're finding some differences in the way people interpreted things we're finding some challenges with using old components, maybe not working as well as they did in 1949. These valves do die. We, we are getting a um, death rate, if you like, amongst the components. A lot of these components are quite old. The little diodes, can, uh, they have a date of like 1943 on some of the packets, so they've never been used, but they're, so they're new, but, but they're not really young. Next thing is Chris on display unit. I think you've bought a display unit to display. Yeah, this won't take long. And you've got some slides as <laughs> well. <laughs> You'll remember from the last presentation I made, I uh, brought out endless photographs of the boxes. And to first order, all you can see is what the boxes look like on the outside. So uh, extrapolating to what it's, what it's like on the inside, knowing what the size of the box was by scaling, it's as big as that. And the idea of making that was so I could lay things out and, and see where all the valves and the variable potentiometers and all the rest of it fit in, including the main transformers for the power supply. So that's all that was, and I brought it along to, for amusement, essentially, or as a reality check. We've also talked about the engineer switches and the unit selectors that load the initial orders. Um, there we've had several goes at designing the circuit, and arriving at a circuit that matches the photographs has been quite challenging. But I think we're there now, we have the principles clear um, and sketches of designs that now need to be worked out in detail. We're unlikely to have the, um, the final delay line store. We'll probably use a semiconductor simulation for that. We may also um, not have the complete input-output system. But I would expect that we will be able to decode instructions, execute them um, and run simple programs in a manner that we have confidence that we have a, a replica, a working replica of the original machine. And certainly in terms of completing the machine by the middle of next year, I'm fairly hopeful we'd match the, uh, the machine as it was in 1949, 1950, which is our target period.